in uh, Aeschylus and Athens, first published in 1940, Thompson describes a visit he made to the Soviet Union in 1935, in which he enjoys a Communist Party festival. He describes it in lyrical terms, the enthusiasm, the flowers. And he says, it was first then that I discovered the nature of the inspiration that went into creating Aeschylus's Oresteia. In subsequent editions of Aeschylus and Athens, after 1956, the passage is removed. It must have seemed to him over the top. He felt that this was the people of the Soviet Union celebrating communism. Mm. And the Oresteia, of course, ends with this wonderful, dramatic, colourful procession which expresses the new harmony achieved by the Athenian city-state out of the violence, the intrafamilial conflict of the past. You reach at the end of the Oresteia a new stage, a new stage of history in which the law court has been established. That means in effect that the polis has been established. Problems of the family, that is to say conflict within the family, have been resolved. It would have seemed to Thompson a very progressive text, a very inspiring text. And so that's why he compares it to the victory of communism in the, in the Soviet Union. Of course, it was naive to do that. However, since um, um, the Second World War, particularly actually over the last 30 years or so, there's, there's quite an interesting to look at the way that conceptions of Athenian tragedy have developed. Because Thompson really was a pioneer in relating tragedy to its socio-economic and political context. Others had related it to ritual, but he was really the first to relate it to its political context, with the exception of some work in 19th century Germany. Because the Germans, of course, particularly in the early 19th century, and the, particularly the pre-Nietzschean Germans, did have the ambition of trying to understand antiquity as a whole. Seems very unfashionable, seems impossible, but they did have that ambition. And I know that George admired Karl Ottfried Müller, for example, who died young, but he was a, wrote about Aeschylus, among other things, to which he brought his knowledge of inscriptions and history and so on. So that was a, a noble ideal that George was following. And um, after the Second World War, of course, his books published in 1940, after the Second World War, books written about tragedy, I mean, I grew up having to read these things, are of a narrowness that now seems impossible to believe. I suppose it's associated with the new criticism and the Cold War, in which they're almost entirely about tragic form. Mm. They make no reference to anything outside the text. There are a whole number of these books. Mm. Now, the, the, everybody's forgotten them now. They just seem ridiculous, particularly because in the 1980s, there began to be a new conception of tragedy in which more people, uh, including myself, more people started writing about tragedy and the polis. The polis is a key to understanding tragedy, which obviously it is. But this has been completely ignored by everybody except George. So in that sense, he was a real pioneer. However, this brings me back again to the ending of the Oresteia, because, of course, that interest in politics has been qualified or tempered by what I call the standard reading of the end of Aeschylus' Oresteia, in which, so far from the ending celebrating progress, celebrating the new unity out of conflict of the polis, with this glorious display of torchlit procession, the Furies being reconciled with the new order, incorporated into Athens in a shrine in a cave. Famous ending. So far from this being a celebration of a new unity, it's become absolutely standard, particularly in the USA, but also in Britain and to some extent in France, to say, no, no, 
what Aeschylus is doing at the end of this trilogy is 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 undercutting himself, querying the whole process. It's the what I call the interrogative mode uh, of understanding Greek tragedy. And you may think that this is a triumphal ending. Of course it's not. He's actually deliberately sowing irresolvable doubt, and this is how the play ends. I won't go into why this is total nonsense, because it would take me too long, and I've published about it anyway. But it's um, a, mo a mode of thinking about tragedy in which Aeschylus, and indeed other tragedians, turn out looking very like assistant professors in California. They're privileging of the interrogative, their hatred of closure, their privileging of doubt over any kind of statement, the love for open-endedness. This is exactly what you find in the American Academy in the humanities. It's almost de rigueur. Everybody's a feminist and everybody espouses this view of the text because they have no understanding of how it could be otherwise. I mean, what is a politically triumphalist text. There's no such thing. There's no reality to which any text can refer in, in a, the kind of capitalist society in which we live. So they have to imagine it, it as fundamentally interrogative. I have to say, this is almost standard, almost standard reading, but it's always representative as if it's a subversive reading. It's not. It's become absolutely standard. It's exactly what you'd expect of a postmodern, depoliticized, text-based academy. And sure enough, it, this, this nonsense gets foisted onto this great text. I mean, George would be horrified. Yes, I mean, George is one of the very few people to understand the significance of the fact for the Oresteia mm. that Aeschylus was a Pythagorean. And he's a Pythagorean in various respects, one of which is a belief in the harmony of opposites. It's not exactly the unity of opposites, as you find in Heraclitus, but the harmony of opposites in which one opposite is superior to the other, and that's how you get a stasis. So light is superior to darkness. The male is superior to the female. One of the factors that goes into this interrogative, undercutting, self-undercutting conception of Aeschylus mm. is that, of course, it celebrates patriliny. The female is subordinated to the male in the course of the of the play um, and uh, I mean people will say yes but it's not really it, it, it's also having stated that cast doubt on it because Athena is um, after all a female even though she says she favours the male in all things yeah. well of course there's an ambivalence within Athena, but it's not an ambivalence with which you're left at the end of the play as the primary conception. It's she's ambivalent because it's what you might call strategic ambivalence. That's how you reconcile the female, the Furies, and so on to the new order. So the Pythagoreanism means that you see the world in terms of opposites, but in order to get political stability and progress, you have to subordinate one opposite to another, and that includes the male ending up dominating the female. And of course, a, a lot of people nowadays are not going to be happy with the idea that that is envisaged as a positive message. But as George says, the subordination of the female was a feature of the establishment of ancient democracy. I mean, it clearly was. I wonder, as, as a way of trying to trying to bring together those two those two strands the marxist and the, and the classicist thompson i wonder whether we could um perhaps discuss the idea of how we saw classics as a as a vocation and a discipline in society because i've, I've got this, this quotation from from thompson here which says the classics have lost touch with the forces of human progress instead of being a message of hope for the future as they were intended in the great days of humanism they have become a pastime for a alleged minority striving ineffectually to find refuge from it and I wondered whether, what did he see the social purpose of classical scholarship and classical study in, in 20th century capitalist society? Well, remember that he's growing up in a world in which ancient Greece has far more prestige culturally than it does now. And um, 
I mean, clearly the First World War made a difference, but he's born in 1903. He probably would have had his first Greek lessons before the First World War. Um, and therefore, may seem to him to have more cultural importance than it would nowadays. But I think the answer he might give to your question is that these texts, this culture is still enormously potent. It's still a aesthetic paradigm. And actually, of course, since... The uh, Second World War, there's been an enormous increase in most of the indicators of the popularity of classics, number of productions of plays, number of people studying it at university, number of people reading the text in translation and so on. All these things have increased massively. What it's lost is its elite place in the culture in which people defer to professors of Greek and so on. I think what George would say is that these texts remain enormously potent and this culture remains enormously potent. I actually agree with that, and I mean a lot of people do. Um, enormously potent, and, and therefore um, they, they, they should be deployed in the cause of progress, but they can only be deployed in the cause of progress if you understand the relation between the culture on the one hand and the social and political development on the other. You can only really understand Aeschylus' Oresteia if you have a progressive view of the world. It's just that, as George, I think, did say once, it so happened that my cast of mind in Aeschylus's happened to be very similar. And that's why I think, he says, I can understand Aeschylus better than other people. And um, he didn't put it in those words, but I think that's, effect, in effect, what he's, what he's saying. So the point is to deploy these very prestigious, aesthetically and intellectually enormously powerful texts in an overall understanding of culture, uh, which is harnessed to creating a better society. So it's that, it's that sort of, the particular mode of historicist scholarship that he's doing that is, that is the, the sort of political crux of, of how he sees. How do you do classics in a way that's socially progressive, rather than, say, democratising or, or encouraging, making text more accessible, perhaps. It's, it's, it's specifically to do the kind of criticism that's being done. Well, he does want to make text more accessible. Right. He does say we should have more working-class students right. doing classics. He most definitely mm. did believe in that. Mm. And I'm sure that when he went to lecture in the factory branches, mm. he would be quite happy talking about Aeschylus, which these people may never have had at school. So he's certainly mm. um, keen in diffusing this culture. I think also that in terms of why would a classicist like Tom Thompson have prestige and command respect within Marxism and within communism? It's, I mean, communism is, Marxism is clearly a sort of theory of the long durée, you know, and, and somebody like Thompson who can comment on, you know, the rise and fall of civilization. I mean, and, and have real sort of explanatory power about um, cultural change uh, is, is going to, you know, is going to be a compelling figure. Uh, and, and certainly his, his intellectual authority within party circles is, 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 is to do with that, having I mean, a sort of anthropological sense of human culture. But then there's the question, of course, of the classicist's estimate of Thompson. And, of course, Thompson's work is probably more widely read than any other classicist in the 20th century, translated into 20 or so languages. Thompson once said to me, a rather in a rather melancholy way. I was never a fellow of the British Academy. Well, you bet he wasn't. I mean, um, he's not going to be a fellow of the British Academy with that kind of political uh, outlook. Um, uh, but he sort of felt it as a bit of a rebuff. And, of course, here, one must remember, in the humanities generally, certainly in classics, somebody writing in the 30s and 40s is most unlikely to be read today in any subject... So in that respect, Thompson doesn't do too badly, actually. Professor Michael Silk said to me that George Thompson was a very interesting figure, but not a great intellect and not a great scholar. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, profoundly wrong. And uh, Michael Silk is a very talented uh, professor with a fairly broad outlook, but he's the most ahistorical of Hellenists. He has no interest in his history whatsoever. He's only concerned with literature. So that remark doesn't actually surprise me at all. Now, there is some respect paid to Thompson by the people who do the new kind of understanding of tragedy from a political perspective. 
but they don't really take his ideas seriously. And as I say, they go in the opposite direction by being obsessed with the open-endedness and the interrogative in these texts. Um, but actually, in his command of technical scholarship, and in various other respects, like his understanding of the continuity of the Greek language from ancient to modern, and Thompson was really remarkable. For example, his most important work of technical scholarship, probably, and he produced a lot, was his commentary on Aeschylus' Oresteia, mm. which had a first edition in the 30s, which it was um, uh, said to be, in effect, a kind of joint production between Thompson and a scholar called Walter Hedlam, who, who was a Cambridge scholar who died young, very, very talented, and left in King's College a commentary on the Oresteia, which was not completed, and Thompson used it and then produced his version. And then in the second edition in 1966, um, Thompson done an awful lot more work on it, and he then made himself the main author and added something to the effect that the work of Hedlund was incorporated into it. And indeed, Thompson is the main author of that text, and Silk is quite wrong to suggest that Hedlund is the main author. Mm. Um, Thompson owed something to Hedlund in terms of method, but the, the commentary is definitely Thompson's. Now, I was brought up to use a commentary on the Oresteia, or little bits of the Oresteia, the various plays of the Oresteia, by Frankel on the Agamemnon, and Page on the Eumenides. And I think I can safely say that when there's disagreement between Thompson and Frankel, or between Thompson and Page, Seven times out of eight, Thompson's got it right, and they've got it wrong. He has just superior judgment. He also has what he calls an objective method of interpretation and of textual criticism. So this is a bit technical, but let me say that what this means briefly. Mm. What it means is that it, what editors often have to do is to restore what they think the original text of um, a play was before it became corrupted, as often it did. And uh, Frankel does it, Page does it, Thompson does it, Hedlam did it. And there are two principles here which Thompson formulates as what he calls scientific scholarship. One is the recognition that ancient literature, certainly Aeschylus, proceeds through a series of topoi, um, commonplaces for the most part, which are often just alluded to by Aeschylus, but ideas which appear in pretty much the same form in a very number of different authors and so on. And the point is they can appear in very late authors um, because ancient literature is extremely static and conservative. This led Hedlam to say that if you want to edit a text like Aeschylus, first you have to read your text of Aeschylus really well and then you have to read the whole of the rest of Greek literature because there can be evidence for what the text of Aeschylus should be in a very late author because the very late author may represent the same topos. And the other thing was to think about the reasons why texts get corrupted. What is called the classification of errors and this means that you have to understand that that um, you have to understand the changes in the Greek language up to the Byzantine period because mistakes are often made because a, a scribe whose language is Byzantine Greek is distorting the ancient Greek text to make it look more like Byzantine Greek. Um, and there are, there's also the intrusion, intrusive gloss, which a gloss is a word or phrase put at the side of a text to explain it, and then when the manuscript is copied, it finds its way into the text and you have to get rid of it. So you have to have a real understanding of how the whole text worked over a very long period and formulate it scientifically, as he put it. Whereas people like Frankel and Page regard textual criticism as the exercise of gentlemanly subjectivity. Mm. It shows you've got style. You have a sense of style and all this scientific stuff is silly, according to them. I mean, they don't do it, but not, for, not because it's silly, because they uh, often don't have the capacity, but, but mainly because they believe in 
the uh, almost mystical relationship between the uh, the learned critic and his text and time and time again they get it wrong and Thompson gets it right so I think his commentaries are much better than Frankel and Page who are two highly lauded famous classicists I think Thompson's will last much longer than theirs I mean I, I'm the last person to write a substantial book on Aeschylus so Aeschylus is a um, particular interest of mine and Thompson is far more useful than any of those people I have to say I'm not typical, but I do I have specialised a lot in East Coast. We've talked already about how in the interwar period there's a sense of sort of cultural crisis which is widely shared, that you know, on the one hand there's this sort of ossifying and increasingly introspective high culture, and on the other hand there's this sort of os- uh, uh, pullulating, brain-softening, lobotomising mass culture. And, and Thompson is clearly always interested in the idea that, 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 that there are other sources of culture, and, and, and his experience on the Blasket Islands is precisely about finding a space in which different kinds of cultural experiences and cultural models are in place. Now, that stuff is, I mean, it, is, it isn't attacked, but those kinds of folk culture, let's just call it that, I mean, isn't, isn't particularly valued in sort of Marxist discourse in the 30s. But around the, you know, the end of the war, uh, the turn to the idea that you know, nations have to find their own national roads to socialism, uh, the advent or the imposition of socialist realism, whatever you think of that, as a, the sort of approved aesthetic mode, and the models of the so-called people's democracies, that are, you know, Romania and Poland and so on, that are considered to be finding their own routes to socialism by drawing on that cultural and political resources of the past. All of this makes... Marxism and the international communist movement much more receptive to the idea of folk culture. And I think this is terribly important. Um, so Thompson's position doesn't really change, but the kinds of things that he's saying enjoy a much wider resonance. A, a, a sort of fairly trivial example of that is you know, that, that sort of interesting minor controversy around Thomas Hardy. Thomas Hardy has traditionally been brushed aside by British Marxist intellectuals as sort of far too gloomy. And Thompson comes forward and says, actually, you know, if we're serious about folk culture and we're serious about the, what culture was like before capitalism and, and the culture of the peasantry, then Hardy is a major writer because, if nothing else, it's, his work is a sort of archive of that structure of feeling or that sensibility. So there, there are these sort of evaluations that, that, that are going on and people become <laughs> much more receptive to the kinds of points that Tom, Thompson is making. That, I think, is the moment of Marxism and poetry. Um, and people like Bert Lloyd are going to Albania and collecting folk songs. I mean, there's, 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 there's a sense in which there might be some sort of cultural third way between high culture and mass culture that has something to do with the resources of the people. Thompson is the is the, the, the CP intellectual who, who speaks to that agenda very clearly. And there's no conflict there. These are the things that he is interested in in any case. It's easy to forget that Thompson was a Leninist. I mean, he, you know, his vision of political advance was one of revolutionary insurrection, you know. Uh, and he, he, he holds true to that position um, in, in, in the... From 1947, 48, 49, in 50, the British Communist Party are um, having to sort of adjust its, it's having to adjust itself, as, as all national communist parties were, to the new imperatives of finding national roads to socialism and the fact that Moscow is no longer sort of acting as the sort of, is no longer openly acting as, as the nerve centre of the international communist movement. And, 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 and Thompson is troubled by what he sees as sort of revisionist currents pulling through uh, the communist movement. He's not alone in this. Garman is also, who's very close to him, is also a disillusioned by what he sees as revisionism. Um, Edward, Edward Upward, the novelist, you know, leaves a lot of industrial workers are, 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 are troubled by this. The basic sort of... Um, the basic problem is how, how the state is conceptualised, you know, whether the state, as Marxists have always said, is, 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 an Im, in, is an implement or a tool of class oppression, or whether it is something that can be refashioned um, by, um, by communists uh, to evolve, you know, whether these, whether these structures can be taken over and developed in some way to take uh, the nation towards communism. I think Thompson 
thinks that if the Communist Party is getting rid of the idea of the dictatorship of the proletariat, it should at least come out and say so. What he objects to is this sort of fudge whereby they never renounce it. Or, um, but they're clearly not thinking in those terms anymore. And I think, he, I think as somebody who's you know, I mean, a, a real intellectual, you know, he, he, he just expected the, the leadership of the Communist Party to have a serious debate about this. And he was absolutely appalled when he was on the National, National Executive Committee that there was no real discussion. Um, that these sort of basic, you know, fundamental questions in terms of the movement and the party weren't being addressed in, in, in any way. And I think that is the beginning of his disillusionment with the CPGB, you know, right there in, you know, 1951 when the, the British road to socialism is, is unveiled. And he watches developments in China, obviously, with a lot of interest. Not, not unusual in, in, in late 40s, early 50s communism to start to find people's articles being sort of larded with quotations from Mao as well as Stalin, Engels, uh, Lenin. <laughs> but, in, but Thomson, you know, is, is clearly drawn to what he sees as a sort of revolutionary purity in, in, in the Maoist position and a, a, a knowing kind of vanguardism. And he's also drawn to... Chinese, uh, what, what he knows, what, what everyone knows of kind of, 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 of Mao's writings on literature and culture, which again are foregrounding this sense of being close to the people, working with traditions, valuing, you know, preserving and um, develop, de developing um, folk traditions and folk culture. So he's, he's, he's inclined to be interested in what he knows of what's happening in China. And he's very taken with Mao's writings. He sees that Mao's writings he, he, are drawing on a tradition of Chinese philosophy, which he sees as sort of inherently dialectical in its own tendencies, and, and in infusing that with Marxism. He sees that as a very potent um, enrichment, enrichment of, the, of, of the Marxist tradition. And then he goes to, I mean, Richard would know more about this, but he goes to Peking in 1955, and he spends six months out there. And from then on, I think he's... he's, 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 he's frame of political references, you know, China is very important to that. It, China is very important to him. Mm -hmm. And then through the convulsions of 56, he becomes very disillusioned with what's happening, obviously, in the Soviet Union, but he shifts his allegiance to China gradually. And then there's the, Sin the, the Sino-Soviet split of the early 1960s. Um, there's a, there's a, there's a, 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 a pamphlet circulate, circulated through, initially through the YCL called Long Live Leninism, which is basically a sort of Maoist critique of what's happened in the Soviet Union since 56. And Thompson, like many others, like McCall, uh, like Garman, like West, to a degree, is very, take, is very taken with this, with, with this idea. Mm. And of course, the other sort of innovation or, or, or um, ideological sort of feature of, of Maoism is it's, it has an alternative account of historical development, which is really fascinating for a classicist, actually, um, or, or, or kind of a historian of the ancient world, actually, that it offers a, a kind of different, a different way of envisaging historical change, you know, as against that kind of Stalinist model and was, was he kind of drawn to that as well as to the sort of uh, the kind of question of, of strategy and organisation? He, he is and what he's, what he's also impressed by I think in, in the light of his experiences of the CPGB you know is the fact that the, 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 the Chinese party seems to have mechanisms to renew itself you know to, 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 to field critique and to critique itself he sees this as part of a sort of Chinese philosophical tradition this, mm -hmm. this you know this capacity for self critique and he, he sees that being carried through um, in the in, in the CP so with that sort of tendency of the party to ossify into the state mm -hmm. he sees that you know that the the, 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 the the Chinese model has as a sort of a strategy or a mode of endless sort of self scrutiny, self questioning, and self revitalization. He's, he's certainly he's certainly drawn to that. Kind of, kind of constant revolution. Yeah. It's yeah. also in the first philosophers, which I think was first published in 1956, or perhaps a bit later. He has a section on Chinese philosophy, um, and he compares it to Greek philosophy. He's interested in the origins of scientific thought which happened in Greece, but also, in a sense, in China, and in about the 6th century BC. And he noticed similarities between these two bodies of thought, which you, you barely find anywhere else in the world, uh, in particular the importance of the opposites in, a, in cosmology. But he also notices differences between them, which he then relates to different social formations, particularly the importance of the centralized state and the emperor in China. But along with that, there are all these similarities. So that suggests 
uh, using the 6th century BC for a kind of global conception of the beginnings of science and philosophy. We've said quite a lot about the influences on him and his intellectual trajectory. Clearly, the project he set himself was in a sense ludicrously ambitious. And that's both the strength of his legacy, but also the weakness of his legacy. So that it's often said about Thompson, quite rightly, that his anthropology was out of date. Engels, origin of the of the family and so on, and based on Morgan, who was a 19th century anthropologist, was clearly out of, out of date. Um, leading him to detect matriarchy, for example, in the early Aegean, which nobody now really believes in. But that actually relates to a second weakness, which he kind of um, grew up too late to be influenced by structuralism. This is an important point. So if you have a myth of matriarchy, what the structuralist does is to say, ah, oh, well, this myth of matriarchy is a fantasy which represents the opposite of patriarchy, which is what we have. You think about patriarchy by imagining its opposite, projecting it back onto the past. That is, very broadly speaking, a structuralist view. And Thompson was not influenced at all by structuralism, simply really because he, he was always interested in finding the origins of forms in material and social processes. He, he hated formalism, um, in which the, which I think is, maybe this is just me, but he may have said something like this, which is so analogous to commodity production. You fetishize the commodity divorced from the process that creates it, similarly with literary form and any kind of form. <laughs> so, so that was his... View, but it did mean that he made mistakes by, for example, imagining that matriarchy was uh, actually a historical reality. Mm -hmm. So the Oresteia is celebrating the transition not just from the tribe to the state, but from matriarchy or matriliney to patriliney. If he'd understood structuralism, he wouldn't have made those mistakes. And of course, there are other mistakes that are bound to be. He would be the first to agree about it if he says things like this. You know, he says it's, it's such a vast field. One person can't do it all. We should have collective research. That was one of his themes. Um, but that's, that is clearly uh, the, the negative of a kind which Frankel and Page would never um, be guilty of because they never for a moment would take anything like such a wide view of the world. But that's also the great strength of Thompson. It's his defiance of the intellectual... A division of labour, his defiance of hyper-specialisation, he's always seen connections, mm -hmm. the engaged polymath, we don't have to believe his conclusions, he got a lot wrong, but we should certainly be inspired by the spirit that he represented. Maybe you should just, I think this is, this caught my eye, this is the, 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 the end of his, his last book, so this is in 1987 when he's just finished this, and I think it's interesting because you've, there's a sort of there's, there's there's an emancipatory optimism which is still there, but at the same time there's there's there's, there's there, there isn't a clear sense of what the agent of that change is, or, or at least he no longer believes that the party is the vehicle through that, that change is going to come. But he says the free play of market forces must be brought under control if our civilization is to be saved from self destruction, and that can only be done by the deprived and the dispossessed. When they take their future into their own hands, they will cast off, that off their backwardness and by releasing new forces, mater material and spiritual, raise civilization to a higher level. And that, obviously that kind of foreshadows all sorts of developments in sort of post-Marxism, doesn't it? I mean, it's got that kind of heart and agree kind of quality about it. It's very interesting. That was probably the last thing he ever wrote. Mm, fascinating, yeah. Did he talk to you about Maoism or any of those? Because I mean, we still don't have a, even a kind of Not really. a, a sketchy no. history of that. that those no. were in a Maoist come to the 60s. No, we mainly talked about ancient Greece, sure. actually. Because he became involved in this China policy study group, but he, but he, yeah. never, he, 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 he never joined the sort of Maoist party. Yeah. So there were a few of them. Remember, he had, he had Chinese works of art in his study. So there was a sort of... I mean, and, and he reproduces them on the cover of... or photographs of mm. China. He's, he's emotionally impressed by China, mm. which is not the only one. No, sure, sure. So, Needham was another big figure in, mm. in, 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 in the study group. He talks about, in that interview with, about Garman, he talks about going to meetings in London in the, this would be in the mid-60s, the time of the Cultural Revolution, and, you know, there were, there were people like John Berger were there, and then Claudia, Claudia Jones, the Nottingham Carnival woman, and Alec West, Garman, and McCall, um, 
and you know there's talk of forming a new party and then and, and Ledger Birch tries that a couple of years later but I think that Thompson isn't persuaded that they have anything like the heft necessary to, to get this going uh, and he doesn't he, he doesn't seem to me to come out ever really and criticise the CP directly there are, there are letters in the archive from the, 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 the China Policy Study Group have a, a broadsheet and I think Thompson has written cr something critical of a daily work of editorial mm. since in 64, 65. What about his attitude to the Cultural Revolution? Do we know anything about that? No, I mean, I think he was affirmative about it and then, like the rest of them, sort of felt silent mm. as things grew dark. That was certainly what we know Nicole's position. But at the time, you know, there was, they saw this as the party you know, regenerating itself.